So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, putting together uh, this workshop in the middle of pandemic. So obviously it was a very difficult task and uh, I appreciate that courage and the organization. Okay, so uh, today I'd like to talk about the subject of uh, uh, fracton phases or fractonic phases. And um, I'd like to uh, think about realizing this space is a real material. So, uh, so you know, we discussed a lot about quantum spin liquid. And uh, as you noticed, quantum spin liquid is a mature field as a theoretical subject. So we now understand pretty well, we have an exact solution. And uh, we even talk about candidate material, but um, this is kind of uh, a new uh, so-called long range entangled phase. Um, so I'd like to uh, uh, start by introducing uh, these phases, like you know, what they are and why they are interesting. Uh, okay, so we have this expanding landscape of uh, uh, topological phases of matter. So we have this uh, so-called symmetric protected phases, and these are mostly uh, short range entangled state. The most famous and the oldest one may be uh, the Holden phase in a spin one Heisenberg chain. But then we have this very popular area of uh, a band topology. And these are all uh, uh, examples of symmetric protected phases. And then there is this long range entangled state like fractional quantum hole state and the quantum spin liquid state that you heard about a lot. Heard about a lot. So now um, I'd like to introduce um, uh, what we call a fracton phases. And this is a new kid in town. And as usual, they usually get a lot of attention, especially by theorists. Okay. So, uh, it turns out these phases uh, depends not just on topology, but it also depends on the geometry of the system. So you have to worry about both. And uh, it turns out these phases has uh, enormous uh, ground state degeneracy. And because of that, uh, a lot of uh, quantum information people want to think about this as an error correcting curve. Uh, so because there's so much redundancy in the ground state, so you know the chances are that uh, that you're not going to make a, a mistake very easily. And now, because of the fact that uh, these phases depend both on topology and geometry of the lattice, uh, then you have to worry about how you can, you may be able to write down a continuum field theory for this, because now you have to worry about both uh, long distance and short distance physics at the same time. So they have some development like that. Also, uh, some people uh, think about these phases as a good example of a quantum glasses. So these are some of the a motivation. Um, so uh, I don't have time to describe the, the, you know, the full details of these properties of these phases, but I like to just describe uh, 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 some key properties of such a phases. So if you create some kind of quasi particles, it turns out that these quasi particles have uh, restricted mobility. For example, uh, you can create a, a particle that can only move uh, along one direction in a three dimensional space. And, and you can create a, a, a point like particles, but you can always, you can only create like um, as a cluster, like uh, here, uh, you can only create four particles at the same time. And if you want to move them, then basically you have to move, you have to move uh, uh, this membrane-like object at the same time. Or well, sometimes uh, uh, you can create those particles at the, at the vertex of uh, some kind of fractal, fractal structure. So it sounds very exotic, but actually there are exactly solvable uh, theoretical models for this. And uh, uh, all these, most of these theoretical constructions are coming from a quantum information literature. And these are so-called uh, commuting projector models. And if you're familiar with the Tori code uh, a model, that's the commuting projector model. So one of the most famous uh, model is so-called XQ model. The model is very simple. Just think about a three-dimensional uh, cubic lattice. And then uh, for each X, Y, Z plane, uh, you think about this, uh, the, the, this, this, this nearest neighbor bond in that plane, then you, you, you have a product of uh, a sigma Z operators, the Pauli operators on that plane. 
uh, all, all these all these poly operators are basically they, they live on the link uh, of the cubic lattice. So you can do that for uh, X, X, Y, and Z plane. So there are three possible uh, four spin interaction term. But then, uh, then you have this uh, interaction on the cube. Uh, you you place a sigma X operator on the edge of this cube. So, but notice that this involves the product of uh, twelve. Uh, sigma x operator. So this is, is, is the monster Hamiltonian. Uh, and the reason why it's called x cube is very simple. There are three x and there's a cube. Let's see, that's why it's called x cube model. Uh, it's not very creative name, but that, that's what it is. And the point is that all of these terms commute, commute to each other. So that's why it's called commuting projector model. The ground state is pretty simple. Uh, ground state is given by the constraint that uh, every the eigenvalue of every operator is just plus one. Then obviously that minimizes the ground state energy. So it's pretty simple. Okay. So it turns out, you know, even though it looks very simple, uh, it turns out this model actually contains a lot of interesting information. For example, if you start from a, a ground state and if you apply a sigma Z operator along uh, this membrane like object, what happens is that your cube operator at the corner basically gives you an eigenvalue minus one. And that's the way that you create an excitation, if you like. And if you try to move them, but basically you have to move uh, all these four excitations at the same time. You can also create a excitation by applying a sigma X operator along some direction. Then again, uh, uh, then, um, you know, you're basically, oh, you always create a, a string-like excitation like this. So it's very hard to create a, just single uh, single excitation that would move freely in free space. If you make a dipole operator like that, then it turns out you can actually turn the corners. Uh, 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 those guys basically this only this guy this guy can only uh, go in one direction. Okay. So why uh, you know okay so it looks cool. So what right? So the reason why it got a lot of attention is because uh, uh, this kind of phases have this massive ground state degeneracy. So, so uh, if you have uh, some open boundary condition on a cubic lattice, uh, if you count the number of degenerate ground state, then log of the ground state degeneracy is basically proportional to the perimeter of the system. So what that means is that if I increase the system size, then I'm increasing the number of degenerate ground state. So what that so so that suggests that I can in principle store massive amount of information in this ground state manifold, and it's ever increasing if you if you increase system size. So this is very very attractive as a quantum memory. So that's why uh, quantum information people are very interested in this. So there have been a lot of uh, development to uh, write down a quantum field theory. So this is not of great interest of this audience, but. Uh, uh, it got a lot of attention from uh, high energy theory literature. For example, uh, Nathan Cyborg and his collaborators are actively working on this subject. Then there's a relation to uh, elasticity theory, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, dislocation and disclinations uh, in elastic theory have something to do with uh, uh, these excitations that I talked about. But then there's also a connection to uh, rank to tensor gauge theory. And this is something that uh, I like to use. Uh, to construct a more realistic model, right? Okay, so, uh, so let's talk about this uh, higher rank uh, gauge theory. This is nothing but the generalization of electromagnetic uh, theory that we already know. So the usual uh, uh, gauge theory or electromagnetism is just uh, a rank one U1 gauge theory. What that literally means is that your electric field is a vector. So we have a, we have a Gauss law, uh, then if you violate the Gauss law, then you have a Poisson situation. And there is a corresponding uh, gauge transformation. Now you can generalize this by introducing a, a rank two uh, tensor. So this is going to be a two index generalization of the electric field. Then you can think about what kind of Gauss law I can possibly write. And there are two ways of writing that. Basically I can uh, use a two gradient or a single gradient. Then if you think about a uh, uh, you know, possible Poisson situation, either I can introduce a, a scalar charge or the vector charge, depending on how you do it. So there are two kinds of uh, a tensor gauge theory or rank two gauge theories. And then uh, using this idea, uh, you, can, you can solve this thing and um, uh, then you can write down a, the corresponding uh, gauge transformation. But at this point, uh, uh, it's a, a trivial generalization. Yeah, go ahead.
Yes, sir. So in the in the usual construction is the uh, symmetric and the traceless, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. See? So at this point, it's a pre general. Yeah. Okay. So what are the uh, 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 properties or the requirement for such a theory? So by the by the time you look at the say rank to gauge theory like this from this Gauss law, the new Gauss law tells you that there actually there are more than one conservation law. So usually we require a charge conservation, but in the in the, in the scalar charge version of uh, rank two theory, uh, you also have to conserve uh, the dipole moment. So you are conserving both total charge and uh, uh, dipole moment. So typically the charge configuration will be something like quadrupolar, for example, like this. Then, uh, uh, but then a lot of charge configurations are something like this. The total charge is zero, for example, to begin with. Then whenever you make a deformation, the total charge should remain zero. The dipole moment should, al should, should also not change, right? So, th so there are only certain charge configurations that allow. It's not, you know, on the other hand, in the usual case, you just have to conserve the total charge. So, uh, you can have a you know finite dipole moment, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, uh, the, if you think about a vector version of this, then again, you have a charge conservation. Then it turns out that there's an additional contribution uh, conservation law. So if you think about uh, charge as a momentum, then this is like an angular momentum conservation in analogy. So if this is, this is what happens, then this vector charge can only move along the charge vector direction. So again, it gives you a mobility construction, a mobility restriction. Okay. So at this point, uh, you know, there's some, there's some similarity between fractal phases I told you about and this higher rank gauge theory. Uh, but in order to make a more precise uh, connection, you have to work harder. You know, it, it turns out that these are the U1 gauge theories, and I have to introduce some kind of uh, a Higgs field, if you like, then you break U1 symmetry to Z2. It turns out that that theory can be connected to a fractal phase. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm actually more interested in realizing phases like in this real material. Okay. So in order to do that, I like to borrow two ideas from previous studies. So I like to review what happens uh, in the case of uh, U1 gauge theory. We have a very good example of uh, emergent U1 gauge theory. Uh, that's called quantum spin ice. And this is a very solid example how uh, the usual vector uh, charge, so usual uh, electromagnetism can be emergent. And then uh, there's this very nice paper by Nick Shannon and his collaborators. And they constructed uh, a classical version of this rank two uh, U1 gauge theory. So I'm going to piggyback on the theory and I'm going to construct the quantum theory for this. So this is basically the, uh, the plan. Okay. So I'm going to briefly review this. It's going to be very short. Um, okay, so the usual story is that we start from uh, 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 the classical spin ice. It's an icing interaction on the uh, famous particle ice, these uh, corner sharing tetrahedron. And uh, uh, you can rewrite this model by defining a cluster spin. So you sum over all the icing spin on the uh, tetrahedron. Then you scale them, you sum over all tetrahedron, then you realize that every side is counted twice. So you correct that by multiplying factor half. And these two models are equivalent up to constant. Now, if by the time you write this way, then it's clear what the ground state is. Ground state is given by uh, all the spin configurations where the cluster sum is zero. And this defines the manifold, the manifold of two in two out configuration. This is the famous uh, uh, ice manifold. Now, in order to uh, uh, make a connection to uh, electromagnetism, so it was proposed that uh, if, you, if you define the spin operators, for example, at the, mid, 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 uh, uh, at the, at the link of the dual diamond lattice, uh, then, uh, uh, then you can identify uh, this Ising spin, Ising spin uh, uh, operator by the electric field. Then you can show that essentially, uh, if, you, if you write down a divergence of this field, and that, that becomes basically the same as the uh, cluster spin, the sum of uh, the component of spin on the uh, tetrahedron. So uh, the, the, the constraint on the, on the Grassi manifold basically becomes the Gauss law. So, so this is the electrostatic mapping uh, from uh, uh, the classical spin ice manifold uh, uh, electrostatics. Now we, we wanna, we wanna uh, go to the dynamics. So in terms of dynamics, in order to do so, I have to uh, uh, add a quantum fluctuation. So you add some uh, uh, transfers 
final fluctuation term like this as plus s minus. Now I can flip my, flip my spin. So now if you assume that this uh, a transverse interaction is much, much smaller than the Ising interaction, I can do a degenerate perturbation theory. And it turns out that the lowest term I can generate uh, is uh, uh, basically six spin uh, ring exchange term uh, around the hexagon uh, in the pyro colliders. So, so what it does is that if you start from one of the degenerate uh, classical ice configuration, and if you apply uh, uh, this ring exchange term, then you flip, 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 you spin, and you then you generate another configuration. This configuration is not exactly the same as the initial configuration, but the new configuration is a member of that massive degenerate classical manifold. So you are always you always remain in that degenerate space. Uh, after applying this, this applying this ring change term. So that's why you never leave your uh, ground state manifold. And that is, that is very important. And then if you do so, then uh, you can have this mapping, namely that the G component maps to uh, electric field, the, the creation operator uh, maps to E to the I uh, vector potential. Then, then uh, this famous commutation relation between G component to spin and the uh, raging operator becomes canonical commutation relation between vector potential and electric field. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping. And by the time I have that, then I have a quantum electrodynamics. In fact, this ring change term maps to a cosine core of A uh, on the lattice. So the lattice action, lattice Hamiltonian looks like that. So I have uh, an electric field square, and then there's a cosine core of A. And if this theory has a decompined phase, then I can expand my cosine and it becomes core of A square. So then I, then, then I naturally get E square plus B square Hamiltonian. And that is precisely uh, uh, the usual electrodynamics that we know of. So this is the way that uh, the U1, uh, U1 rank one gauge theory can be immersed in the real material. Okay, so having said that, now I'm gonna move to the uh, more complex object, the, 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 the new kid in the town. Great. Okay, so in order to realize this, um, we are going to use um, a, what we call breathing power of colliders. In fact, uh, a material like this exists, namely that uh, uh, the size of the tetrahedron on the A and B sub lattices uh, of the dual diamond line, they are different. So, so naturally, the exchange interaction on the A tetrahedron is bigger than the exchange interaction on the B tetrahedron. Okay, so, the, the, so that's basically the situation. Um, so uh, the particle lattice uh, uh, looks like this, you know, uh, there are uh, A sub lattice tetrahedron, B sub lattice tetrahedron, and then each sub lattice uh, is basically FCC lattice. And since I'm lazy and I don't want to draw all this tetrahedron all the time, I'm gonna replace my tetrahedron by a dot. So these green dots are uh, basically up tetrahedron, the yellow dots are uh, 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 down tetrahedron. So there are AB sub lattice structure uh, in this part of our lattice. So that's the diagram that I like to use. Um, okay, so now uh, just think about the most general uh, nearest neighbor spin exchange interaction on the part of our lattice. Just write down every possible term that's allowed by symmetry. Uh, then uh, you have a Heisenberg interaction, Dalotinsky Moria interaction. You have a famous Kitaev interaction and also what people call a gamma interaction, the symmetric on exchange. And there are, these are some constant shift. So this is the most general top if you only uh, uh, require the nearest neighbor interaction. So we are going to use this phase general model. Okay. And the assumption I, I'd like to make is the interactions on the B tetrahedron is much smaller than those on the A tetrahedron. So there is a separation of energy scale. And I also like to assume the Heisenberg dominance over other anisotropic interactions. So these are very, very reasonable uh, assumption. Okay. So, uh, but instead of uh, working with this uh, very complicated spin model, it turns out it's much more useful to write down this model using normal mode of uh, spin, up, spin operators or, 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 or those, those spin. So what happens is that, yeah. That's correct. Yeah, so at this point, right, right, exactly. So at this point, uh, let's think about a classical model first, okay? So I'm gonna start with a classical model. So these are not operators, these are some vectors. 
Okay. So, <clears throat> so in this case, uh, instead of dealing with that complicated spin model, it turns out uh, it's much more useful uh, to write down a model using the normal model. So basically, the, the fundamental unit is really tetrahedron. So there are four spins at the vertex of the tetrahedron. And using the fact that uh, the, the local symmetry of the tetrahedron is a TD, I can classify the normal mode of uh, collective motion of these four spins uh, using the irreducible representation of uh, the tetrahedral group. So there are, there are, there are five irreducible representations. As you know, A means uh, single, single mode, E means doubly degenerate, P means uh, triply degenerate. So there are, there are one, two, three, three, three modes, normal mode, if you like. Question? Okay, right. And there are interactions like normal mode like that are in the A tetrahedron, B tetrahedron. And you may, you, you may argue that how can you separate degrees of like that? Because each vertex is shared by A tetrahedron, B tetrahedron. You just count twice. You correct that again by multiplying half factor, then you're perfectly fine. Okay, great, right. So, so for example, you can work out uh, the mapping from that microscopic model to this normal model analysis. And all of this uh, A coefficient, uh, these are basically the mass term or the interaction coefficient is basically represents energy cost uh, to, to excite this mode. All of that can be re-expressed as some combination of uh, those exchange constants that I wrote down. So this is the most general uh, model you could write. Okay. So again, I'm gonna assume that Heisenberg dominates over all other small interactions. And if you do so, then you immediately realize that uh, the, the heaviest mode uh, is this guy. This guy has the largest energy scale. So I'm going to get rid of this heaviest mode and I'm going to set those modes to be zero. So I'm going to get rid of this mode because this mode basically holds the largest energy possible in my model. Okay, so it turns out that you can do so if uh, hydrogen interaction is anti Okay, And that basically uh, imposes certain constraint and that's going to be important, especially uh, I'm, I'm getting rid of this mode for the B tetrahedron. And remember that my B tetrahedron spins are all connected to the A tetrahedron. So these guys, of course, part of the B tetrahedron, but they also belong to the A tetrahedron. So by the time you remove one mode here, it's gonna give me uh, some constraint on the behavior of normal mode of A tetrahedron. So it gives you some constraint and that constraint is very important. So uh, uh, it turns out, it looks very complicated, but what actually happens is that the normal mode in this four tetrahedron, they're all interrelated. And that's why you have to, you know, in the continuum limit, it becomes some kind of a gradient operator. So it looks complicated, but actually it turns out I can nicely write down uh, some kind of Gauss law um, using uh, basically a, a, a rank to tensor uh, electric field. So it, turns, it, it, it looks like this. So for example, uh, there's a symmetric traceless part, there's a traceful part, then there's the anti-symmetric part. So, you, you know, it consists of three uh, 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 matrices, but it's just uh, uh, the rank to uh, 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 tensor. And if you use this representation, then you have a Gauss law. And so that's, you, you immediately see that uh, uh, all, the, all the entries of the electric field is basically the normal mode are variable, but then uh, this, you know, then, then basically I have a nice Gauss law. So there's some, uh, so you can already see the uh, analogy to the length two theory that I talked about. Okay, so, okay, right. So, but then, you know, to make a further progress, I like to successively remove, uh, you know, a higher mode and I like to keep only the low energy mode. So it turns out it's useful to keep only the so-called E mode and T, T1 minus mode. So E mode again, doubly degenerate, uh, a T mode is uh, triply degenerate. So if you only keep this Sorry, mode. There's a question in the yeah. chat. Um, What's the question? Are you contracting the divergence with one of the indices of B or J? Yes. So that the zero is in the That's correct, yeah. We, so the, the, uh, it's going to be a, a charge, you know, a vector charge theory. Okay, good. Okay, so if you make this simplification, uh, then uh, it turns out uh, the uh, we you know we can just keep uh, uh, traceless symmetric part of the rank two uh, electric field and in that case theory is particularly simple 
And then, it be, you know, the Hamiltonian just becomes essentially E square with this uh, Gauss law constraint. So we have a mapping uh, from that uh, classical spin model to a uh, rank to uh, tensor gauge theory. Okay. But this is a classical theory. And we, what we really want to have is a quantum theory or fractal. So how you construct this? Oh, oh by the way, uh, you know, this choosing low energy man manifold sounds like a fine tuning, but actually it's not. It turns out, for example, in this case, you can just set uh, all this K gamma interaction to be zero. If you only keep Heisenberg and Jalochinsky Moria, then you just automatically arrive at this. So, so you know, this is it's pretty natural uh, construction. Now, in order to go from, uh, maybe I will skip this. Uh, okay, so in order to go from uh, classical model, model to, pro, from classical model to quantum model, you have to work much harder. And you may immediately encounter a lot of difficulties when you try to do so. The reason why it does that is that, remember that these electric fields that I introduced, these are actually spin. They are not commuting variables, right? So it has all the difficulties with dealing with the spin Hamilton. Okay. So, so if you try to quantize this theory directly, uh, then it just immediately becomes a non commutative field theory. And I don't know how to solve that. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so that's why uh, it's not easy to solve this model. So instead of um, uh, directly attacking this model, we decide to look at a different limit. Here, we are choosing actually different uh, low energy limit. Uh, the details are not important. Uh, we are just choosing these two modes, the low energy limit. If you do so, uh, then uh, among three possible uh, components of the rank to tensor, I just uh, pick out the diagonal component from the symmetric part, but I allow a finite trace. And it turns out that this model is much easier to solve. And so, but still a uh, rank to gauge theory. And it has uh, the same uh, Gauss law constraint. So for example, you know, you have a basically the same kind of a conservation law that I talked about. Okay, so let's see how it goes. And again, uh, you know, it doesn't really require a lot of fine tuning. You can get there by making some choices of interaction in the, in the original model. Okay, so let's talk about a quantum theory. So uh, we are gonna work with the theory. I'm gonna define this new electric field as a sum of uh, a symmetric piece and uh, uh, the, the part that has a finite trace, and then they satisfy this uh, Gauss law constraint. Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, uh, rewrite this model. Remember that I'm basically keeping two normal modes. It's what we call an E mode and A2 mode, and they have the same mass. Okay, so then uh, we should not forget that there is actually interaction in the B tetrahedron, and that's going to be quite important. And, and, and so that is still hanging around there. And by the time you write the model like this and, and rewrite this variable in terms of this electric field operator, it turns out it's actually very simple. Remember that I only have a diagonal component here. So it's just a diagonal component square, some of the diagonal component square. If you regard uh, those guys as the, three components of the single vector, then it just becomes a, a rotor model, basically uh, some electric field square. So this model itself is pretty simple. And in fact, since these are spin variable, they satisfy nice SU2 commutation relation. Uh, this model is simple, but, the, but all the difficulties are in this constraint as usual, right? All the, all the difficult, difficulties are in the constraint. This model itself is pretty simple, okay. Now, uh, now, just like uh, you know, ordinary quantum mechanics, the E square is like S square, and G component of electric field is like S chat. So uh, the you know the quantum numbers are like this. So so we can actually figure out the ground state of each tetrahedron first, and for each tetrahedron, the ground state is bifold degenerate with this with this with this quantum number. It's basically a a, a state of S equal two manifold. For, for each tetrahedron. But point is that I have to arrange uh, spins in such a way that I satisfy the constraint. And if you, if you do so, uh, if, you, if you count all the degenerate ground state by, by, by imposing this Gauss law constraint out of this uh, uh, manifold, then, uh, yeah, then you find that we actually have a massive degeneracy. 
And that massive degeneracy is what I'm going to describe. Okay. Right. So uh, again, another another uh, important uh, yeah, information is that if you relax the Gauss law constraint, what that means is that you are now allowing the excitation to show up. Then again, uh, 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 again, uh, these are basically vector charges. You know, the x, y, z component is a rank two gauge theory with the uh, vector charges, and this. This what we call uh, these charges or electric charges. It turns out they are actually located at the at the B tetrahedron center. So my electric fields are defined at the A tetrahedron site, but my charge is actually defined at the B tetrahedron center. And and this is basically a Poisson's equation uh, written uh, in this coordinate. And this these vector charges. Uh, now we are thinking about a quantum theory, so they satisfy some SU2 uh, algebra again. Okay. okay. So these are spinal charges, basically. Right. And also, uh, uh, the, the, if you, uh, if you uh, apply a raising and lowering operators, then you can either create, uh, create or destroy those charges at the beta tetrahedron center. So again, my, my rank to electric fields reside at the A tetrahedron center. But my charges are located at the B tetrahedron center. Okay, that's, that's the important thing to remember. Okay, so now, now uh, I should not again forget the fact that there are residual interactions that I I I have in my B tetrahedron, and this B tetrahedron model uh, for the part of the Hamiltonian, I can actually completely rewrite it in terms of variables in the at A tetrahedron because again. Each spin belongs to also a tetrahedron as well as b tetrahedron. So again, without giving you details, it turns out that if you rewrite it in terms of variables in the a tetrahedron, that gives me some kind of raising and lowering operator. And this raising and lowering operator basically gives me a quantum dynamics. If I start from some uh, 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 spin configuration or uh, in your charge configuration, then if I apply this perturbation, then I can move my charges. Then I can move my spins. So before that, before I introduce this, they are just degenerate spin configuration essentially. But I can move around, move from one state to one one configuration to the other by using this perturbation theory because then I can create or create or destroy my charges. And I I like to describe to you physically how that actually happens. So let's focus on uh, this term. Basically, I'm 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 creating and destroying uh, charges at nearby a tetrahedron site. So I I apply e plus here, I apply e minus here, for example. So that's what I'm going to do. Great. So um, so imagine that I start from some spin configuration, a charge configuration. Uh, then I apply just single raising operator on the a tetrahedron site. Then you can show that. Uh, if I if I apply a raising operator on the A tetrahedron side, that immediately create a four charge configuration like this, basically some kind of quadrupolar charge configuration like this, uh, at the nearby B tetrahedral location. Okay, so in terms of three-dimensional picture, it looks like this. You create a, a, a extra spin up or spin down a configuration, uh, and this is uh, not an individual spin, but basically some kind of collective spin. Of uh, uh, made of this this tetrahedron configuration. So now, if you apply uh, e plus and e minus at a nearby a tetrahedron site, then then you see that uh, 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 e plus generate this quadrupolar configuration, e minus create another quadrupolar configuration. Then interestingly, uh, the the charges created at the center, they basically annihilate and disappear. Then I can keep doing this uh, by applying a more operators like this, uh, basically you know, some high order perturbation theory that you, you keep canceling charges in the pole, you keep doing that. Uh, then essentially what happens is that uh, all the charges are pushed to the boundary and the bulk charges all disappearing. So you are basically creating a cluster of charges at the edge of the membrane-like object, and these charges are moving towards the boundary of your system. 
And if you keep doing this, and if when you reach the boundary of a system, now if you impose a periodic boundary condition, then you can show that uh, with the periodic boundary condition, now you can remove all the boundary charges. Then I go back to uh, uh, ground state manifold. So again, just like the example of quantum spin ice, if I start from some spin configuration at the beginning, I apply all this stuff, I move all the extra spin or charges uh, created to the boundary, right? Then, then, then when, when you annihilate them by boundary condition, I go back to that ground state manifold. It's not the exactly the same initial state, but the, the resulting state will be part of this manifold. Okay. And one case, so one case show that this way, I can basically reach every degenerate uh, uh, spin configuration, every degenerate uh, uh, state in my ground state manifold. Okay. So you, you can get basically every, every uh, and this is pretty similar to, uh, you know, example of like quantum hole effect where uh, the way that we generate a degenerate ground state, we usually create quasi particle and quasi hole pair that you move them along the boundary, you annihilate them, you go to another ground state. So this is kind of a glorified version of that, but it's a much more complex process. Okay, great. So uh, ground state degeneracy, uh, we couldn't find the analytical formula. I think that we need some algebraic number theories to find this expression. We just couldn't find it. So we decided that we are gonna torture the computer. So we just counted by brute force, uh, basically, Counting all the degenerate state, uh, uh, you know, basically make, make the computer to do all the work. So uh, this is my unit, if you like. <clears throat> so what I call LX, LY, LZ, one on one means that this cube actually already contains uh, many tetrahedron. So these are, remember, green dots are A tetrahedron, yellow dots are B tetrahedron. So there are already a lot of spin. Um, so for example, in this case, I would call that volume one, perimeter three, this kind of cube configuration. And if you count the ground state, then it's actually 85. Now you keep doing this, and now you increase the system size. In, in, in this unit, by two on one, then it becomes already over 1,000, okay? So now you keep doing this, you see that uh, you, you have a massive number of degenerate ground state. Then we try to find the rule here. Uh, uh, interestingly, for example, uh, uh, if you look at the system size where uh, the, the, you know, either, either perimeter is the same or volume is the same, the number is different. So obviously it's not just a function of volume or perimeter. But one thing we notice is that for the fixed perimeter, uh, uh, the la la larger volume actually gives a smaller ground citizens in contrast to your usual intuition. For a fixed volume, the other hand, the larger perimeter gives you a larger ground state agency. Okay. So, so this much, we can sort of qualitatively understand why that happens. For example, uh, uh, if you just think about a case where your system size is almost one dimensional, elongated only one direction, then actually uh, it's pretty simple. Then uh, the ground state agency monotonically increase the length of the system. In all other cases, what happens is something like this. So ground state does, does not monotonically increase the volume of perimeter. And we, again, as I said, for a given volume, uh, if you have a larger parameter, then ground state degeneracy is larger. And that we can understand this way. Remember that I was basically using a, some kind of membrane like operator to construct a you know, boundary excitation. And I move them to the boundary and I annihilate them, create another degenerate ground state. So, upper, uh, so obviously, if I can construct more and more of those membrane operators, then I can create more and more excitation. Right? So more and more degenerate ground state. So this is, uh, yes. So it violates. It, uh, I, I don't know. Okay, so I don't know the result in the thermodynamic level. So I don't know, I don't, yeah. Yeah, I think it's so extensive. It is so extensive. So extensive. So extensive. Yeah. Sure. If, if I just 
separate is the limit between the external integration and the time in terms comes from the boundary. Uh, the the interaction coming from the p tetrahedron. Yeah. So that basically gives you the dynamics. But you do have so the, since you have a, you said that you go from one configuration to another, so some time in the yeah, the spin flip top. There's a spin flip top, the e plus e minus term. That's that's the that's like a s plus s minus term in the. Yeah, so that's coming later. Yeah, so that's actually, yeah. So okay, I'll, I'll talk about this briefly. Yeah, okay, great. So um, okay, so. So what I was trying to uh, say is that uh, if I can construct more and more membrane-like objects like this, then what that means is that I can have more and more degenerate ground state. So I can count the number of uh, membrane operators like this. And it turns out that uh, for FCC lattice, there are two Li number of planes in each direction. So the total number of planes is this. So obviously, because of this, uh, 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 you, you, you have a larger ground state degeneracy for a given volume. Now, the, the reason why uh, you have a smaller uh, degenerate ground state degeneracy uh, for a given parameter is because it turns out total number of constraints increase the volume. So there's a competition effect. So, so there's a competition between parameter and volume effect. And that basically limits the uh, a number of possible ground state degeneracy. Yeah. Okay. So now I, uh, okay. Okay. Again, this is. Answer to Chandra's question. So the ground state DJ is actually non extensive with the volume, or, 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 but it depends on the geometry. It depends on the geometry. So, so notice that, you know, depending on the geometry, ground state DJ is, is different. So to us, it's very strange, but for quantum information people, this is very useful. Okay. Now, uh, tunneling. Okay. So now we only, I only talked about electric field. But then you can ask me, where are the magnetic fields? Because in a, in a fully quantum theory, I should also have a magnetic field, not just electric field. And these are basically the tunneling process that you talked about. So, you know, uh, so how quantum fluctuations may actually generate the magnetic field in the pole. Okay. So we look at that. And interestingly, uh, we don't generate this in the finite order perturbation theory. So, you know, again, I don't have time to describe the, all the details. It just, you know, it, it's the property of this particular model. I don't think that this is generic, but that this particular model, because of the geometrical way that charges are created, we find that uh, uh, if you do the finite order vacuum fluctuation, that's what basically what you're talking about. Uh, we basically, uh, the system does not come back to the ground state. In fact, uh, you can do this if, you, if your system size is very small. In fact, uh, you know, this is like, you know, we only talked about electric field square at this point for the Hamiltonian. We are asking how, you know, whether you can generate B square term. It turns out the one over the you know, magnetic permeability, you want that to be finite, to have a finite speed of light, right? <clears throat> so here, according to, if you do a perturbation theory, uh, then in order to generate a magnetic field, it turns out you, you have to go all the way to the boundary. You have, a, you have to apply a perturbation theory many, many times until, until you reach the boundary. That's the property of this phase, okay? And because of this, this magnetic permeability depends on your system size, essentially, well, L square, right? This guy, perturbative parameter, the L square. So in the thermodynamic limit, uh, your magnet, one of the magnetic permeability goes to zero. So therefore, uh, for any finite size system, your speed of light is finite, but when the system size becomes larger and larger, your photon becomes slower and slower. And in the end, photons are basically localized in the thermodynamic limit. <clears throat> and what that means practically is that it takes a very long time to tunnel from one ground state to the other. And that's basically the connection to this quantum glass-like behavior people talk about in the, in the fraction phases. No, no, it's not low energy invariant. Actually, the photon goes like K square, the length two theory. It's not, it's not linear in K. It's not low energy, low energy invariant. Yeah. Okay, so there's some connection to uh, uh, quantum glassiness. Actually, uh, you know, people like Claude Chamon and uh, Rahul, uh, 
uh, Rahul, non-tissue, and you know, they talk about this in general. Um, the question is, you look at a max education, but then the question is what, what the coefficients are, yeah. right? Exactly. You, I mean, again, you, again, you get this b-square term. It's just that the coefficient goes to zero in the thermodynamic limit. So you, if you only care about finite size system, then it's fine. I mean, your, your photon is slow, but it's there. You just have an awfully slow photon, that's it. No. Yeah, so actually, I mean, what I mean by Maxwell education is the generalization of the ordinary Maxwell education. Yeah. There is a gauge in <clears throat> Okay, there is a gauge in there. Yeah, there's a, there a gauge in there is associated with the rank two theory. So, again, everything makes sense if your system size is not infinity. Okay, good. I think I'm going to the end of that. So, okay. So, so that's all I wanted to say. And this is the summary. Uh, so again, I, 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 I claim that uh, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a model that only involves the two spin exchange interaction on this green particle lattice. Um, and there are gap charge excitation that can only move as a cluster. And there's a self extensive ground state degeneracy that depends on lattice geometry. In this particular model, photons are localized in the thermodynamic element. Um, but I would say this is far more realistic than your XQ model where you have a 12 spin interaction. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. So you did this on a power flow lattice, but but all of the the numerical things that you did were essentially 1D or 2D. So so essentially, if it, are you saying that if I just have a, a two-dimensional subspace of the pyrochlor lattice where I just uh, essentially use a tetrahedra from the pyrochlor lattice to form a two-dimensional Kagame lattice, let's say you would have all these properties in 2D? No, no, no. Actually, the theory, theory is constructed for the three-dimensional cubic, three-dimensional particle lattice. It's just that when I counted the, the ground state degeneracy, uh, I you know okay, so I, just I, I, I can only do that. Yeah, I can only do that for the finite size system. Okay, and those instances happen to be two. Yeah, but, yeah. But then that leads to the next question: Is there a two-dimensional model which has these properties? So uh, these fractal models are inherently three-dimensional. I see. So, and, and actually, some of us believe that the two dimensional fracton model may be confining. What that means is that uh, uh, you, you may not get this phase. It's just like uh, some of the two dimensional spin liquid phase is unstable. Mm -hmm. So, it's possible that uh, some of, you know, most of the 2D fracton models we can construct is the most likely unstable. So, that's what we believe, but uh, I don't think there's a proof. The last question is just some physical intuition. So, you started off by, by saying that. Uh, you know, if you wanted long range entanglement. So, so the long range entanglement is contained where in the, at the end of this? I mean, it, what I seem to see was sort of the, the, class, the classical calculation. So it yeah, in the fact, entanglement, it, where does the yeah. entanglement uh, appear if I wanted to? Yeah, ask. so in fact, there are some studies, you know, the, some people actually computed uh, entanglement entropy. Yes. Uh, for uh, for uh, the ideal factor model, okay, and in that case uh, you can show that indeed uh, the integral entropy uh, is is quite large. Actually, it depends on your system size as well. So it depends. So even for this model that you yeah, showed, so if I divide them, I can divide it. In yeah, the yeah, integral entropy depends on the geometry of the lattice. So That's it's a it's a very very weird uh, property as well. Yeah, so, so I'm still a little bit intrigued by this idea of C going to zero. And I'm wondering whether there's a way to take some limits in order to, to have it depend on the order of limits you take. For example, if you go to T equals zero first, will you get a different, uh, a different entropy? And if you go to the thermodynamic limit and then you go to T equals zero or where there's, there was some sort of ratio there that you could play with 
Can you take some limit? Um, from X so, so we haven't tried that. So it may, that may be a good idea. But uh, what we tried is that uh, on the, you know, uh, I I could add more lattice size on, on top of this uh, breeding particle lattice. I mean, there's no there's no such a lattice, but I can add artificially add some lattice size. Then then I can make it work. Then I can make the uh, velocity of light to be uh, finite. The thermodynamic limit. So that's why I'm saying this property actually depends. This even this property depends on the geometry of the lattice. So you know, yeah. Yes. I know you have an effective B, but is is that saying that uh, that there is uh, Zero being inside the system. So zero uh, in the thermodynamic limit. When uh, yeah. 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 Now, uh, can you can you relate your B to some physical quantity like uh, some uh, strain in the system or uh, right? The, your your B is constructed from. Yeah. It's, the, uh, it. Uh, I don't know what's the corresponding quantity in the elasticity theory. Actually, I'm not an expert of that. But that, but there is a yeah, there is a, but there is but there is a there is an object that corresponds to be in the yeah. I think that there is a mapping. Yeah, yeah. I think it's related to that. Yeah. So there is this um, article written by Leo Ladziowski. He's an expert on elasticity. I think he, he has this mapping between rank to gauge theory and uh, the, 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 elast the, 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 the the topological defects in the elastic medium. But I actually, I'm not the right guy uh, to answer the question. Uh, part way through your explanation, you talked about the low lying states that you're interested in on, I think it was the A tetrahedra as being equivalent to uh, a spin two degree of freedom. So I wondered if you could write the problem that you're dealing with in terms of these spin two degrees of freedom coupled uh, by the B tetrahedra. I mean, does yeah. Hamilton, <laughs> you, you, I imagine you could get some kind of spin two Hamiltonian for spins on, on the A tetrahedra and then... Uh, I think so. I think, I, think, I think there is a way to uh, write a model like that. Uh, using the usual skin variables, uh, I believe so. Yeah, it's just that it's just that uh, uh, there's some constraint on that spin model that's related to this Gauss law. So, so uh, yeah, it just it was just more convenient to write this way. But I think that uh, there are ways to write down more in some more conventional uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, last question from the chat. Did you find an approximate formula for the ground state degeneracy? No. Perhaps I missed it. How does the entropy scale? Yeah. No, I think that somebody has to find out, but uh, maybe it's not me. I just I was just not able to do so. Yeah. We try very hard, but. Uh, uh, it was hard. Just we, we just don't have a formula. Okay. It'll be nice. So follow up, no, but <clears throat> how does it stay? Uh, so the only thing, you know, I basically describe everything I know. So it's a self-extensive, and uh, it depends on um, both parameter and volume. And uh, there are two competing effects. Basically, you know, there's number of constraints that scales with the volume. And number of operators that will generate a more degenerate ground state that scales like parameter. So there are two competing effects, and that's the reason why uh, this, you know, the the dependence is not monotonic. Yeah. So that's why it's hard to find that formula for the for the usual model. Uh, uh, you know, the 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 most interesting exactly solvable model is probably what people call Haas model, Haas code, and that one uh, he has a exact exact expression for the for the ground state degeneracy, uh, and in that case. You know, he knows the answer because actually he constructed his model starting from algebraic geometry construction. So, so in some sense, 
he already knew the answer when you write down the model. So in that case, you know, but in this case, uh, we don't know the answer. Okay, then let's thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you very much. And because of time, let's meet at um, 4.10, so 20 minutes coffee break.